I am James Davenport, uh, Associate Dean of Social Sciences at Rose State College uh, and the uh, organizer of the Free to Choose School Choice Opportunities, Obstacles, and Options in Oklahoma. Uh, and today we have, uh, as part of our presentations, Jennifer Carter uh, with the American Federation for Children. Um, she is the senior advisor for the American Federation for Children in Oklahoma. Uh, she's played an active role in expanding Oklahoma's Lindsay Nicole Henry Scholarship Program to not only include children with special needs, but also foster and adopted children. That program provides recipients with state funds uh, to attend private school. In her professional career, Jennifer has also been an assistant insurance commissioner for government, uh, government relations at the Oklahoma Department of Insurance and as director of legal services and government relations for a non-union asso education association. In her work for the Teachers Association, Jennifer successfully helped teachers decertify the National Education Association affiliate as the district's teachers bargaining representative. Jennifer holds a Bachelor's of Arts in Letters from the University of Oklahoma and a Juris Doctor with a Certificate in Comparative and International Law from the University of Tulsa. Welcome, Jennifer, and thank you for uh, agreeing to make this presentation for us. You bet. Thanks for having me, James. I'm excited to have the conversation and talk about the different school choice programs we have in Oklahoma and why they're important. Great. Let me pull up my... PowerPoint and share that with you all. All right, looks like you can see that well. Yes. Perfect. So um, with the American Federation for Children, we believe that every Oklahoma child deserves a world-class education, no matter uh, where that education is provided. And a lot of people I don't know how much time, uh, James, you really want me to spend talking about what school choice is, because I don't know where in your program we're going to fit this. Go ahead. You, this slide is fine. Just go ahead Perfect. and, and uh, you know, you can briefly run through this. That'll be great. Sure. So again, school choice is about a fundamental right for parents to have access to the educational environment that best serves their children. Um, those options include traditional public schools, open enrollment, virtual and brick and mortar options, course choice, magnet schools, public charter schools, home schools, private schools, um, and under the private school umbrella, tax credit scholarships and education savings accounts. So the whole gamut of choice, any choice that a parent could make, we believe that parents are the best um, people to make those decisions for their kids. So why do we support school choice? Research shows students with access to school choice programs are more likely to enroll in college, uh, enroll in and graduate from college. They tend to have higher standardized test scores, uh, are less likely to be incarcerated and less likely to develop mental illness or attempt suicide. That, that uh, uh, causes me, I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, no, but I'm sure. gonna throw out a, a question here. Uh, what are some of the, you know, maybe two or three primary motivations of, of parents when they're thinking about maybe moving their child from their a, a traditional public school environment into another one? What what usually is, is going on to kind of drive that decision? Well, that's a really great question. I think I don't think I know from talking with parents that there are multiple issues that cause a mom or dad or grandparent to feel like another environment would be best for their kid. Sometimes it's bullying. Sometimes it's a particular special need that their child has um, in Oklahoma City in particular. Um, there's been a lot of children who are diagnosed with dyslexia and they've not been able to get the reading services that they need in their local public school for whatever reason. And there are a couple of schools here in Oklahoma City, one school in particular that I can think of that's a private school that really works hard with kids with dyslexia and helping them to um, manage their the way that their, their brain brings in words and how, how they're able to, to read and, and can supplement those kids with the necessary tools so that they can be successful and um, lifelong readers. And so, so we're seeing uh, some private schools 
develop the capacity to specifically um, uh, serve that kind of student population uh, Correct. with dyslexia or perhaps other uh, learning disabilities and such. Correct. Um, there are a couple of schools that focus on kids with autism. And um, so there, yeah, there are lots of opportunities as these programs develop, um, it provides opportunities for these schools to really develop a niche and serve those students really well. Okay. Awesome. That's a great question. I think it's really important to talk about. Yeah. So who are, who are we at AFC? We, um, we, again, our mission is to make sure that every kid gets a world-class education. We've been working in Oklahoma since 2014 to lobby, advocate, and elect um, great people to advance school choice policies. Um, we've been involved in passing the largest expansion to the Lindsay Nicole Henry Scholarship, as James mentioned early on. And we also were a part of the largest expansion to Oklahoma's scholarship tax credit program uh, that happened in 2021. And then we support school choice candidates um, like the governor, um, superintendent. Well, he's now the superintendent. I need to change that. He's no longer the elect, right? He, he was sworn into office last right. week. And um, and other, you know, lots of other pro school choice lawmakers who care deeply about making sure that kids get the best in education. Um, I like uh, th these next couple of slides are really important to me because I think putting a face on the policy discussion is really important. And we have, this is a grandmother who has a, a grandson that she's raising. She's a primary caregiver and her uh, grandson has autism and ADHD. And he was having a really difficult time in his local public school and um, was being bullied. And now he's in a new school and he is thriving. And these are the children, these are the faces that we need to contemplate as we we think about these policies and it's really easy for us to talk about these policies um, and, and think about them in more of a legal way and, mm -hmm. and in a theoretical way, rather than understanding the individual children that we're trying to serve. And so for me, the school choice movement is about people and not so much about policy, but the policy is the mechanism by which we help people. Right. And the same for um, Mr. Fierce, who uh, he just is one of my favorite kids um, to think about. He graduated um, from Cristo Ray last year. I believe he was part of the first graduating class. Okay. And, um, and he talks about how the faith component of their school really helped him fill a role because his father is incarcerated and, um, and helped develop his faith. So again, there are lots, there are myriad of reasons why a, a student and or a parent would want an alternative for their child. And this is just one great thing uh, for this young man to have been able to take advantage of in his school. And then just, you know, innovation in the classroom. I love uh, Mr. Titus and he is the superintendent of the SNU Lab School here in Bethany. And I love this, this discussion that he has of the multi sensory and multi, um, uh, oh gosh, multi, a multi way approach to learning something. When you, they're talking about ancient Rome here and they've got their middle schoolers, you know, one is looking at the content and then the other is is thinking about how do we restore the Colosseum ruins and another trying to figure out how we build a city aqueduct and how they you know brought all those kind of hands-on ways to learn about ancient Rome and bring their learning to life. So here we talk just a, a little bit about some myths versus facts. You know um, there are some opponents of school choice who will say that private school choice programs violate the separation of church and state, where the Supreme Court has ruled in a number of cases that that is not, the, that is not accurate, um, that 
it, it is constitutional and it is appropriate as long as the the program is designed uh, in a way that that meets constitutionality that the faith based component does not violate the separation of church and state. I, I was going to ask is that that's something I one of the criticisms uh, I often hear of um, these kind of uh, programs is that well you're using tax dollars and they're going to religious institutions or whatnot. Uh, and uh, I was hoping you would you would kind of talk about that, maybe a little bit more of, you know, not just, okay, the court said, yes, these are permissible, but but why why is this uh, something that, uh, that argument, how does that restrict parents from getting the kinds of education that they think is important for their children to have? Well, I, I think, you know, we, our, the origins of education in our country were faith-based. Um, and I think people forget that. Like the, the whole state or national system of education began out of churches. And so um, it, it seems a little silly to me that we would be concerned about a family choosing to have their child educated in a faith-based environment where you know you could argue that that in spite of or be, you know, I mean you could say maybe even because of that faith-based environment those students for the most part are outperforming their public school counterparts and so um, you know teaching English and math and reading and writing and analytics and science doesn't have to, it's, it, it, it's agnostic, I guess, in, in, in a mm. way. So it doesn't matter if that those things are occurring in a faith-based institution. Same goes for, you know, let's talk about Medicaid. You can take your Medicaid and your Medicare dollars to a faith-based hospital. Um, and the, you know, it's sort of incidental to the service that is being provided um, in terms of the medical care, right? So the faith piece of, of education in those faith-based schools is incidental to the learning that is occurring um, in, in the classroom. So we have lots of different examples that government partners with private faith-based organizations to deliver services with tax dollars. Okay. And then the, the second myth here um, that's pretty popular is that, you know, school choice programs drain money from public schools. Um, and most most uh, private choice programs save millions of dollars because the local dollars stay with the district. They do not follow the child to the school of their choice. Um, the federal dollars don't move with the child. We're just talking about a portion of the state funding that is intended to follow the child. So there are other buckets of money that the state provides, like health insurance and teacher retirement. Those monies are uh, funded outside of the state funding formula. So those monies stay in the public school system. They don't go with the child to the school of their choice. So we're really talking about a smaller uh, portion relative to the other buckets of money, if you will, that, that are allocated for educating children. This is one of the very frequent criticisms that I hear. In fact, I was on some social media earlier this morning and saw someone who posted something about school choices just taking money from teachers. And, uh, and so you hear this a lot. Uh, and uh, it doesn't see, it seems like, almost like uh, the advocates and the opponents of school choice are talking uh, in two different languages and using two sets of numbers to discuss this sometimes as to how much, how much and where the resources to fund uh, this kind of program would come from. Yeah, no, I, th I think I think in some instances it's an obfuscation from the opposition because they just don't want kids to go to a different environment or they're operating out of a sense of fear or they don't aren't fully aware of how funding occurs. Mm -hmm. Sure. So uh, in Oklahoma, we kind of touched on this a little bit. 
uh, for private school choice programs, we have two private school choice programs in Oklahoma. One is the Lindsay Nicole Henry Scholarship that we uh, briefly touched on earlier. That are these scholarships are for students with uh, special needs or disabilities, um, students who have been adopted from foster care or are in foster care, um, children who have transferred from uh, uh, into the state from as a result of military orders who were on an IEP uh, when they came in with their transfer, and then students who were served by Sooner Start or had an out-of-home placement with Office of Juvenile Affairs. Okay. So those are just uh, some of the students that are served through the Lindsay Nicole Henry program that has been in, um, in existence. It was passed in 2010. Um, and it's been around for a good while. And I believe we're, we're around 2,000 students who participate in that program. Okay. The average um, scholarship is $7,346 from the 2021-22 school year. Now, um, if, I, if I'm a parent and I have a student that I think qualifies for this, who would I contact to explore uh, some of these options? That's a great question. Um, feel free to contact me. I can direct you um, to the place that you need to go. But the State Department of Education has a website that, or a web page on their website that's dedicated to the Lindsay Nicole Henry program. And the application for the program and the requirements of the program are on the State Department of Education's website. And a family can um, download the application and fill it out. They would need to have um, documentation that supports any of these qualifying criteria to attach with their application. And they can apply uh, for the current school year up through uh, December 1st is the deadline. If they apply after December 1st, then they're applying for the next school year. Okay. And the department will let them know um, once they've applied and submitted all their documentation, how much uh, money would be allocated for that student because it's based on the weights and the formula for that child because different disabilities um, and different grade levels have different weights associated with them. So there's not like a flat number that is associated for each kid. It's very individualized. Okay, okay. And so that if I understand the process as you, as you've kind of outlined it, they would contact, say, the State Department of Education, uh, get a determination as far as what uh, what amount they would qualify for, and then they would start looking perhaps for a, a private school alternative that would uh, that would meet their needs, satisfy what they're looking for. And now, how does that funding get to that school? Okay, I want to I I'm. I probably didn't outline this first. The, the parent needs to have applied and been accepted to the school before they apply. Okay, so they need to find a school program. first, really. Correct. Okay. And on the, the Lindsay Nicole Henry website for the district, there is a list of approved schools because they have to be approved to participate in the program. Okay. And on our website, which I'll show at the very end of this presentation, we also have a list of which schools have been approved for or participate in both of our private school choice programs. Um, so they would, they would apply with their school, get an acceptance, then they would go to the State Department to determine what their scholarship amount would be after they have submitted their application um, and accompanying documentation. Um, and then the money then is transferred to the school. I want to say it's quarterly, but I could be mistaken, but I believe yeah. that the payments are made from the State Department directly to the school quarterly on behalf of the parent. And the parent... I believe has to sign or endorse the check that is sent over to the school on okay. behalf of the student. Okay, great. That's really good information. And then the second private choice program we have is Opportunity Scholarship, which again is a tax credit program. So a um, the way this program is funded is not with tax dollars, but with donations that are made either by individuals or businesses to a scholarship granting organization. And uh, we have several scholarship granting organizations, but one 
primary organization that serves a number of schools. There are a handful of schools that have their own scholarship granting organizations, okay. um, but the main one is the Opportunity Scholarship Fund. And um, if you wanted to participate in that program, again, you would apply to the school that you wanted to go to, and um, then you would apply for a scholarship from either your school's program, if they have one, or to the Opportunity Scholarship Fund. And you um, would then be notified how much of a scholarship you would be provided. And that just ranges based on income level and um, and how much money the SGO has in their budget to allocate scholarships. Um, but there are some qualifications here that uh, a family has to meet in order to be able to participate in this program. Sure. So family income is no more than 300% of what it would be to uh, qualify for free or reduced lunch program, okay. which in 22-23 is uh, for a family of four, $154,000. You have to be a student who's eligible to attend a public school um, or attend a public school that has identified a need of improvement. Um, the special needs portion of the scholarship allows for a larger scholarship. So the maximum scholarship, if you're not a special needs student, is no more than 80% of the average per pupil expenditure. Okay. So um, I want to say last year that was about between six and seven thousand okay. dollars. So that would be the maximum scholarship. And by the way, uh, along those lines, that the average tuition in Oklahoma for private school is about sixty five hundred dollars. I was going to ask that. Um, uh, a lot of questions come up as well. How would this meet, and would would it really be affordable? Um, and I know also, you know, there are a few uh, in that average, there are a few schools that have they're kind of elite preparatory schools that kind of push that average up a little bit. Uh, yes. But they're not the schools that most parents would be looking at to, to, to send their children because of the expense. Right? Correct. And, and those elite preparatory schools, for the most uh, nearly all none of them participate in these private choice programs. Okay. So they prefer to stay elite, yeah. <laughs> uh, at least in their mind. <laughs> um, but yes, to, to your point, they do bump up that average. So, you know, a $6,500 average in terms of a private school tuition is very, can be very affordable, particularly if we were to adopt a wide based, uh, a broad based program, because then the, the gap for a family to meet that need wouldn't be as difficult to reach if they were to get some help. Great. Um, I think that's all uh, on the opportunity scholarship. Okay. Then I wanted to show this because I just thought this was so interesting. It's the only way we can really look at, from a na national standpoint, how public schools are doing versus a private school. And if we look at the most recent NAEP scores that were released this summer, and you see, or this fall, early this fall, um, if you look at how the, the losses that we saw for public schools right. um, in math and reading, uh, they were pretty pretty, it was a pretty big loss. And then you look at Catholic schools who their measurement, they in math had no loss and in reading, they had a, a little bit more of a loss um, in fourth grade. And then you look at eighth grade reading and math. I mean, there's a little bit of, of loss and actually a gain in eighth grade reading mm -hmm. where we saw just traumatic losses in, in public school. And so- oh. I thought that was just a really interesting bit of data. Yeah, I was going to ask, is there uh, any kind of source uh, for data on student performance in uh, specifically in Oklahoma private schools? Would, uh, would the NAEP uh, information, could they drill down and just pull out Oklahoma private schools and find that? Or is there I another source? I don't think there's not a centralized source. 
Uh, most schools, if you ask them for their data, they will have their like ACT data, mm -hmm. their graduation rates. Um, but I, there's not a centralized place where they're required to report any of that data. So it would not, be not kind of like a clearinghouse of, uh, for data for, okay. All right. Correct. Uh, so, but, so that, that prompts me another, uh, uh, question that, that you might be able to, to help us with is, um, if I'm family and I, we feel like, you know, our, our, our child or maybe our children are, are not getting as, uh, as good an education or an edu maybe it's a good education, but it's not the education that my child needs. It doesn't provide them some opportunities. It doesn't match their skills or interests. Um, how, how do they go about, what's the best way of going about researching the other alternatives to figure out what school specifically would then meet that, that criteria for my child? Sure. Well, I think the first thing a parent would want to do is you know, what is it that my child needs? Like, what is it that I'm looking for that would be different it, or that I'm hoping that my child would get in a different environment and, mm. and make a list? Like, these are my criteria. These are the priorities that I have. And then I would look at either our website that gives a full list of schools that are in participating programs and start looking at their websites and okay. seeing, you know, where do they have some of these buzzwords of things that I'm looking for or hoping for my child to get and then call them and, and have a, have a conversation with one of their admissions people sure. and do a tour. I highly encourage tours and um, all private schools that I'm aware of welcome families to tour their campuses um, to see you know, what the environment looks like, go on a school day and see what's happening in the classroom, you know, ask mm -hmm. to visit the classrooms of the, of the ages of your children or the next grade up and, and see what's happening in those classrooms and spend a little bit of time to see, is this really the environment that I'm, I want for my child? Right. Um, and, and then make, and then ask around. Uh, a lot of schools will even ref have parents that can be available to you to answer questions about their experiences and the things that they like or don't like, or you know how to navigate different environments at their school. Um, but I, I just think it's really great to equip yourself with a lot of information um, and and distill that through what are the needs of my child. Sure. So this last, uh, I think this is the last slide, you know, what's missing? We've got two private school choice programs. We have charter schools. Um, we, I mean, there's a lot of argument to be made that we can revamp some of the, um, the way that we authorize and allow charter schools to come into existence um, and expanding that opportunity, I think is really important as well. Um, but what other private choice uh, program is missing? And I think people call, you know, either a universal voucher or a universal education savings account. And by the way, those are two different mechanisms of, of paying for education. Right. Um, so a voucher, the Lindsay Nicole Henry Scholarship really is a voucher. And so what happens with the voucher is you apply for the program and the state remits the payment directly to the school only for tuition. So it's a, a, a voucher for tuition. Um, an education savings account functions a little bit differently in that the money gets deposited that the per pupil expenditure that you would be allowed for your um your education savings account would be deposited into an account for the benefit of your child. Um, and it could be expended on any number of educational um, expenses like, like tuition, like curriculum, books, um, some extracurriculars, some tests like the ACT, the SAT, um, certification tests if, uh, or a career tech. If a child wanted to go to career tech and mm -hmm. take a welding program and get a welding certification, you could use the funds to pay for those kinds of, of expenses as well. Um, but only approved expenses and only 
payments can be made only to approved vendors. Okay. So there are a lot of controls in, in that system to make sure that the money goes only to its legally allowed use right. and to um, approved vendors who provide those legally allowed expenditures or uses. So let me ask you this, in, in this kind of setup, uh, schools that wanted to participate, that wanted to be eligible for parents to to pay, uh, use the, the their education savings dollars, if you will, to go to that school, that school would have to be uh, approved, uh, I guess, by the state correct. to receive the, those payments? That's correct. Okay. And there's a, you know, a criteria, they need to be an accredited school. So in all of the programs that we have currently, the private school has to be accredited. And so that means that there's some standard that that school has met to be able to provide education to, to students in order to participate in the program. Sure. So, um, the estimated value or the average value uh, per child under this education savings account proposal would be about $5,000. So again, if we're talking about $6,500 average for, for tuition, um, $5,000 would really help a lot of families get where they need to go. And a lot of schools have their own um scholarship funds that they provide. So for the needier families, the families who have uh, less income to help them bridge that gap from $5,000 to, to being able to really afford tuition um, is something that, that would be so much easier because those schools could stretch their philanthropic dollars further among more families. Okay. Okay. Um, what are some of the trade-offs that families should be thinking about when they're, if, if they're thinking about moving from uh, a, again, a, a traditional public school into a private school setting, what are some of the, the considerations that need to go? And I just think of my own uh, experience. Uh, I uh, attended a, a private school from seventh grade on through uh, the rest of high school. Uh, and, you know, our high school didn't have all of the different programs that, that a public school would have, but it had some other features to it that uh, my family found uh, uh, beneficial or and whatnot. And so what if I'm a parent and I'm considering this, trying to make that, that choice, what are some important things that I might want to be thinking about? Sure. Um, again, I think based on what your child's needs are, mm -hmm. you know, if they are just needing a smaller environment. Right. Some kids, um, particularly in, in the metro and suburban areas, the schools and the classes are not even the, the classes necessarily, though, maybe in some instances, but the schools are so big. Right. There are just so many kids where you've thousands of kids in a particular school. So maybe your child just needs a quieter, smaller environment. Um, I mean, that that could be a really positive trade off sure. for that family. Um, transportation is a, a, a potential trade-off, right? So um, some families take advantage of their, um, their local school's um, bus um, sure. system, or some live close enough that they can walk to school, right? Um, so figuring out how to, to navigate transportation. Now, under an ESA, you could use a portion of that money to... Um, take care of your transportation needs. But also, I mean, there are a lot of families who carpool and, and share some responsibility. So there are ways that you can, can navigate that and, and getting in a private school um, situation, families are often um, very willing to help meet the needs of other families who, who have some transportation issues. Um, so that'd probably be a, another of those things sure. to think about in terms of a trade-off. Um, some schools don't have the same kind of uh, sports programs that are offered uh, as the, the your local public school might. And, you know, for your child, that might be an important thing. Mm -hmm. And it may not be. They may not care about that. Right. Um, so those are, I mean, just a handful of things I could think of just right off the top of my head. I think that, yeah, that to me that sometimes when we're thinking about uh, a change like this, it helps to know, okay, what do we have? currently and what would we get over here what might we lose and really sit down and say what is it you know if I 
uh, if I have a child that, like you said, that athletics are really important to, then that might shape a decision one way. If I have a child that maybe are really into science and math and there's a private school option that gives him a little bit more uh, opportunity to grow those skills and, and, and develop them, uh, that would be a consideration. So I appreciate you kind of kind of pointing some of that out. Yeah, I think it's always great in those kinds of decisions to do, to your point, a cost benefit analysis. Mm -hmm. Like what are we, what, what are we gaining? What are we trying to gain? Like really that in my mind, that's the biggest piece of it. What, what is it that we're trying to get for our kid that, you know, that we want better for and, and how can we accomplish that? And is it worth whatever potential sacrifices there are to get what you need for your child. Sure. I think most parents feel like there's not a lot that isn't worth sacrificing to get their <laughs> kids what they need, right? Sure. Exactly. And so if we can, you know, alleviate that burden a little bit, at least from the financial side, I think it's really important for us to do that because, you know, we as a society have already decided that we're going to pay for education for, for kids K through 12. And so if we're going, if we've decided as a society, we're going to do that, why wouldn't we take the next step and make sure that whatever education we're providing for a child is the most appropriate, beneficial, and um, great education for that kid? Right. Uh, I think uh, um, you might leave us with some some parting thoughts about what uh, uh, what the need for this this new expansion is why why is this such an important uh, um, uh, issue within education uh, right now uh, uh, if you if you have any parting thoughts that you could leave us with on that yeah I, I mean I think again I don't want to okay I'm not I'm not sharing right now right I'm not right. sharing. Yeah. okay <laughs> technology <laughs> I, again, I mean, as I was just saying a few minutes ago, I think it's it's we as a society have already decided that we want to make sure that we educate the public, right? Sure. And so I think some have lost sight of what public education means. It is not a system. Public education is not a system. It should not be a system. And I don't think it was ever intended to be a system. It was intended to educate the public. And so if you think about it in terms of educating the public, it doesn't matter where that education occurs as long as the education is occurring. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Jennifer, thank you so much for your time here and sharing your, your knowledge and uh, um, insights on this issue. I think it's going to be very helpful to uh our, uh, our participants to, to get to hear from someone who's been immersed in this uh, in this process and who's seen it from a variety of, uh, of perspectives and, and have seen how uh, school choice can can affect people's lives directly. Uh, so I appreciate you spending a few minutes of your time uh, sharing that knowledge and insight with us today. I'm very happy to do it. Thank you so much for the invitation and I hope that uh, people begin to ask more questions. And if uh, if somebody wanted to reach out to you uh, or, or the Americans, uh, the American Federation for Children directly with uh, some questions or whatnot, what would be the best way to to go about that? Sure. If they want to email me at Jennifer at Libertas Consulting LLC.net. That is my email address. And okay. I'd love for anybody to reach out with comments, questions, suggestions ideas. Um, that would be great. Fantastic. Well, thank you again. And uh, we will see you next time. Thank you so much. All right.